I'll start by presenting you. Um, okay, so we're very pleased to have Professor Udi Zuhari today with us in our seminar. Udi did his BA in biology and physics at the Hebrew University and then a PhD under the supervision of Shaul Hochstein at the Hebrew University. He then did a postdoc with Bill Newsom and Mike Shadlin at Stanford University, investigating how visual cortical electrophysiological responses are coded and related to perceptual sensitivity. He then returned to the Hebrew University to open up his new lab. He works on vision starting from electrophysiology in the past and to the best of my knowledge, he then moved to work with Yuma fMRI investigating both perception and also looking into action related mechanisms through novel research directions developed in his lab. He already then started to investigate visually impaired individuals with exciting research and revelations about the role that visual cortex plays in blind individuals and how vision and additional sensors, senses as tactile and auditory inputs activate the visual system and interact even in your typical development. Many students he supervised have now opened their uh, own successful research labs in Israel. In recent years, he has taken a new direction, looking into vision restoration following congenital blindness and investigating how vision develops after skipping or missing the critical period, developmental period. This is done in a project in Ethiopia in collaboration with Professor Shimon Ullman, Professor Uri Polat, and Professor Mark Ernst. He published many papers in top leading journals, including Nature, Nature Neuroscience, and many others. He leads the Swiss Friends Vision Laboratory, linking um, perception, memory, and action. And today, we're delighted to have the opportunity to hear about your research, Udi. So welcome to our seminar. Thank you so much. And uh, let's start then. OK, so I'll uh, be talking today about uh, on the acquisition of vision functions following early onset and prolonged visual deprivation. And uh, this work has been done with many uh, collaborators that I will mention as we go. And it's been uh, funded by the Israel Science Foundation and uh, lately by the DFG, the German Israeli uh, Foundation. And I, I wanna st start with uh, discussing the essence of human vision from the uh, point of view of learning. So this, this is courtesy of Shimon Ullman. And uh, one, uh, when thinks of, one thinks about uh, vision, one uh, should start with what's happening with the retinal image. So you can think about uh, the retinal image as being composed of an array, a two-dimensional uh, array of light intensities uh, in different positions uh, in the visual uh, scene, which are then transformed through uh, processes taken in the brain, starting in the eye and taking the brain into uh, uh, a picture which we uh, understand, okay? And le leading to perception and scene understanding. And if you haven't heard the Shimon's talk or my talk previously, you probably have not seen this image uh, in your life. And this is from uh, uh, the tsunami, I think in, in uh, uh, the Philippines or wherever. And you immediately understand what's happening, although you've never ever seen uh, a similar image in your life, uh, definitely not an experienced one. And so amazingly, uh, this is learned in our uh, infancy and childhood internally without supervision. Okay, so this is a, a, a major uh, uh, process done by the visual system to, to learn to interpret these uh, levels of activation in the retina and, and translate them into a, a, a percept which can be applied to any image shown, even if it's a completely novel one. And the way to think about this is that uh, we as children are exposed to these videos of, that are basically uh, levels of uh, luminance in different positions in the scene and they are interpreted as uh, the scene and they are uh, learned without world knowledge. You as an infant and a young kid, you just get input in terms of uh, watching many, many of these movies shown here and you develop representations of uh, uh, various concepts. 
Now, how is this achieved? So vision, of course, is achieved by uh, multiple cores of both measurement and inference. And when we talk about measurement, the first thing that, you know, typically uh, uh, doctors, eye doctors, uh, and uh, people who are interested in low level vision would study would be uh, uh, spatial acuity. So they would basically uh, test your ability to tell uh, uh, these uh, gradings at different uh, spatial frequencies. And here's the data from Lynn Kjorps and uh, others who have measured this, uh, the conscious sensitivity as a function of the spatial frequency in monkeys and humans. And I'm sure uh, most of you have been exposed to this. So basically you can see that uh, with, uh, basically with time within uh, weeks, uh, 49 weeks in monkeys and 48 months, four years in humans, one reaches the, the uh, adult level of, uh, 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 conscious sensitivity, meaning that what you see that these uh, um, these curves shift to the right, so you're able to see higher and higher frequencies, and they also are conscious sensitivity uh, grows. That means that you need lower contrast to detect that there's uh, uh, a grating in the image. And you can sort of understand this if you look at that image, and you can sort of uh, show that this is equivalent to uh, Initially, you see the image at very low uh, uh, contrast, and with uh, time, you, 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 uh, it's blurred, and with time, you get a better, be uh, better and better appreciation of the uh, image and the details that it contains. And uh, so uh, you can look at the uh, uh, contrast, uh, sorry, you can look at the, sorry, uh, at the contrast uh, sensitivity, uh, as a function of time here and uh, convert this to uh, spatial resolution. And you see that the spatial resolution in terms of cycles per degree increases with time, uh, both in humans and in monkeys, not in the same um, uh, time frame, but to a similar level. And this is equivalent to the Snellum equivalent that uh, people uh, typically uh, people in, uh, are measuring when you come to the uh, to do your eye test uh, reaching 2020 at about uh, as I said uh, within five years or so and when you think about principles of measurement you should think about uh, there's certain elementary principles of measurement so you can think about them as one having a local analysis of data within a receptive field so this is you know uh, following Ubel's and, uh, Ubel and Weasel's uh, work, showing simple cells, complex cells, and so on and so forth. And that there's a representation of the form uh, of a retinotopic map. So uh, neighboring neurons map neighboring areas in the visual field. And furthermore, that there's uh, uh, multiple maps in a hierarchy of uh, processing stages. So that uh, initially uh, neurons are sensitive to very, uh, basic features, and as you move up in the uh, hierarchy, the neurons have larger receptive fields and are uh, sensitive to more and more uh, complex features. So I'm sure all of you know this, and this has been basically uh, uh, the cornerstone of building convolutional models of object recognition, which are now being used uh, uh, wildly in uh, computer vision. Uh, and I don't need to uh, get into this, but the only thing I want to mention here is that this is a, conv a convolutional uh, model, which is based on supervised learning. That is that you uh, have at the last level, uh, basically a comparison be between what is expected and what is actually seen. So that in, in that uh, respect, this is supervised and there's a propagation of the uh, cor corrections to uh, lower uh, levels. So I won't get into that in deep detail, just to mention that uh, these insights about measurement have been used in these uh, convolutional models, the, the idea of an receptive field, the, the idea of a um, um, retinotopic map, and, and the idea of a hierarchy that is imposed uh, in these networks. So, one can think about this as sort of uh, processing done from uh, 
in terms of low level vision, moving on to uh, intermediate uh, level uh, vision and to high level vision or what's called the visual, visual cognition. And when one thinks about this, one can think about what happens at the level, low levels. Well, at the low levels, you have multiple cues for motion, luminance, color, texture, disparity, so on, which are used to extract contours and uh, assess the boundaries. And when you get to intermediate level vision, then you use uh, other more sophisticated cues to extract 3D surfaces, such as shape from shading, global motion, occlusion, et cetera. And then finally, at the high level, one identifies objects or agents, actions, and, and one can understand social settings, and one can use vision for action and predict, of course, uh, uh, the outcomes of his or her actions using memory, attention, context, and priors, and also uh, integration with other senses. So all this is probably known uh, to you. And sorry for taking a few minutes to just have an introduction to the, uh, to the issue. And the point I wanna make is that beyond me measurement, I mean, up to now, I, I was talking about a process which was uh, sort of uh, bottom up, moving from low level vision to intermediate level and to high level vision, but obviously there's also feedback and this is uh, done via inference processes, which already Helmholtz uh, mentioned. So Helmholtz mentioned that perception is the result of unconscious inferences. And that uh, when one talks about inference, one should think about using prior assumptions about the world to make predictions and using hypothesis testing through top-down information flow. And so one can think about these, uh, one, one should introduce these red lines about uh, information stemming from high level uh, uh, areas and going back to lower level uh, in the form of uh, feedback to make sense of the uh, visual image and of course to learn. And just to give you a few notions for this, so you know, one example is Adelson's uh, checker shadow illusion. So if you look at this, you would all agree that uh, A is darker than B, but if you actually were to measure this, you'd find that A and B, this is what I did here, I just isolated these elements, as Edelson did, that they are of the same luminance. And as Edelson and others have said, the visual system is not very good at being a, a physical light meter, but that is not its purpose. The important task is to break the image information down to meaningful components and thereby perceive the nature of the objects in view. Okay, and I think, uh, again, you are probably familiar with uh, the idea of the reverse hierarchy theory uh, put by uh, Charles Ochsten and Merav Achisar and Shimon Rimmel said similar things that basically uh, perception uh, proceeds as a countercurrent uh, along the uh, uh, cortical hierarchy where the first uh, flow is uh, related to vision as a glance or vision, the gist of vision versus the vision with scrutiny. And this is of course the, done through the feedback uh, pathways that we all know that are in, uh, uh, abundant in visual cortex. So these are shown by the red arrows here. And finally, uh, in this introduction, I wanna introduce work done by Dani Arari uh, together with uh, Shimon Ullman about complex uh, scene understanding. So what he's done is basically take images, which you will see an example now, shown them for uh, different times before he uses backward masking, you know, with, with a mask shown here uh, to uh, uh, mask the image and to see how much information you have about the image. So just as an example, here's one. So anyone can tell me what was in the image? Well, the, for the shortage of time, I'll, I think that probably some of you could see that there were there were two uh, people, maybe infants. Sharon, what can you give us some information further than that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it was they were outdoors, uh, sunny, uh, not sunny, but anyway, blue sky. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it was a. Couple. Anyway, to keep it short, yeah. to keep it short, you got the gist that there were two kids there. Probably uh, many of you did. And it's outdoors, correct? And indeed, okay. Now, now let, let's see for a little longer. Well, now you probably saw a little more details. And uh, 
to keep it short, uh, Danny looked at how much information one has as a function of the length of time in which the stimulus is uh, displayed before it's masked by the mask. So initially you can tell that there's two kids there interacting, maybe they're talking and so on and so forth. So two boys are mentioned, but as you um, move on to present it for 200 milliseconds, well, you could see that there's the, the two are separated, there's a part or wired. And this is from, uh, uh, if you're wondering, this is from a movie. Uh, I don't remember the new, Danny, can you help us what movie is it? Never mind the details. But the, <laughs> The story, uh, that really, does, uh, let's not take it to there. Uh, the story here is that uh, you basically uh, need more time to gather the information, okay? And, 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 this, is, and, and uh, this is a lengthy process once you have a scene which is uh, somewhat unexpected, okay? So this is not something you expect to find uh, if you uh, see an outdoor scene, at least some of the elements here. And that uh, takes uh, time to uh, figure it out through, we think, some uh, feedback processes, which uh, I won't get into. The, that you probably heard this from uh, Daniel Arari's talk in the same seminar some time ago. Uh, if not, you'll hear it in the next, his next seminar. Anyway, so, but the point I want to say is that full scene understanding takes time, okay? And now, and I would say that it takes time because you have to implement these inference routines to make sense of what's going on. And there's uh, many elements uh, of inference that are being used for that, uh, and which we might get into uh, a bit later. And now the question is the, that the following the project that uh, we have started some uh, eight, seven or eight years ago, is the, the issue of what if you regain vision after long-term visual deprivation from birth? Uh, so as I try to give you briefly, the vision entails learning, okay? Uh, and significant learning, uh, which we are sometimes unaware of how difficult the, the job is. Uh, so uh, we do not think about this as a language which I think we should, okay? And the question is that the, this learning, as I mentioned briefly, is done in an unsupervised uh, manner. And it's, uh, it, it's quite sophisticated in terms of the mechanisms in, in involved. And it's not clear if you uh, had very little vision in these formative years uh, of infancy and uh, regain the vision only at the age of uh, five, eight, 10 or 15, what functions can you acquire? So this is the question that we are uh, interested in. And as Sharon mentioned, we started the project Eye Opener in Ethiopia, where there are children with congenital bilateral cataracts that are not treated in infancy. So as you know, cataract is a, a very, uh, uh, common disease at the age of 60, 70, and 80. It's much uh, less common at the infancy, but uh, there, there are uh, uh, cases. And uh, in Israel and in the West in general, it can be easily diagnosed uh, at birth and it's treated within three to six months uh, after uh, birth. But in Ethiopia, there's these kids who are uh, born with uh, congenital cataracts and they're not treated, they're not surgically treated. So if it's not treated, it uh, results in uh, uh, blindness, almost complete blindness, except sensitivity uh, to light. There may be uh, uh, different gradations of this depending on the, uh, the individual, but generally uh, these uh, kids are very limited in terms of their uh, vision. So our group finds these uh, children and performs a simple cataract removal operation. And this is done by Itan, Itai Ben Sion, our uh, leading uh, pediatric ophthalmologist. And following this, and even before uh, treatment, we test their vision developing uh, uh, after surgical treatment. 
So just to uh, remind you, what is cataract? Well, cataract is an opacity of the lens causing light scattering and image blur. So uh, basically, if you look at the uh, normal eye, you can see that uh, the lens is nice and clear. And therefore, there's a clear uh, image uh, that is uh, portrayed on your retina. But if you suffer from a cataract, the lens it becomes opaque and it, it doesn't uh, uh, allow the uh, most of the light does not pass through and reaches the uh, retina. And the light that does reach the, the retina uh, is such that it uh, generates a very blurry image on your uh, uh, retina. And as a consequence, your uh, vision is very, very poor uh, without treatment. And the treatment is simple. It's a replacement of the lens with a, an artificial one. Uh, but solving the optical problem may not be enough for uh, some aspects of vision, because of course, if the optics is uh, poor, you don't see, but this is a, a necessary but insufficient uh, element to uh, generate functional vision. You have to have uh, the proper development of all the um, uh, machinery from the eye to the brain and in the brain, of course. So, uh, Rafi, I haven't heard you. Well, <laughs> so uh, far, no problems. So, so, yeah, so far, it's just the basics. Yeah. So, uh, regarding our inclusion criteria, it's uh, we're talking about congenital bilateral mature cataracts. So here you can see a child with a cataract are easily uh, detected. You can see the, the whiteness of the, the, uh, the, the eye. So it, it's really a terrible shame that these kids, which anyone who sees it can say, ah, this is a cataract. If you've ever seen a cataract and still they don't get treatment, they're in, uh, typically in blind schools and they remain in blind schools and, and, and we find them in the blind schools, also in the community and take care of them. So, but they do have a, some light perception. So they can tell something about the, 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 the source of light. And if it's very, very close to them, often uh, they can uh, say something about the object, but it's very, very limited. Their age is above five years old. So uh, they are variable. They typically suffer from sensory nystagmus. So the eyes keeps, uh, there's an uncontrolled jitter of the eye, which is a telltale style, sign of the fact that they had uh, congenital cataract. Because if you don't treat these uh, kids by six months or so, then they uh, typically develop nystagmus, okay? And so since we have not seen these kids at birth, uh, we uh, rely on their nystagmus as a sign that the uh, uh, cataract has developed early, very, very early. We cannot say uh, with complete uh, assurance that this is from birth, but this is uh, within a few months from birth. And the last criteria is that they have no cognitive impairment. Okay, so what happens after surgery? Well, you wouldn't be too surprised to find out that uh, typically their contrast sensitivity improves with time. So here you see one patient and we, which we've measured his contrast sensitivity uh, a few times uh, after surgery. So this is within uh, uh, two months. This uh, uh, patient gets to maybe be, be able to see something of the order of, of I'd, I'd say, uh, eight uh, cycles per degree or even 10 cycles per degree. So this guy has made a major improvement initially, almost an order of magnitude in terms of a, uh, his or uh, her uh, spatial vision. In a, another case shown here, the, the sorry, uh, the, the effects are less dramatic. Uh, and as you can see, we could run this, uh, uh, patient before surgery, and he's had some uh, residual vision, spatial vision before surgery, but this was limited to less than one cycle per, per degree, which is uh, classical. And after that, uh, she improved a, a bit, uh, but uh, not much beyond uh, uh, a few days after uh, surgery, which is, uh, so the, this is, uh, variable across subjects, but generally we find that, uh, so this is the group results. So we plot here the uh, cutoff frequency uh, 
the pre-op cutoff frequency versus the post-op cutoff frequency. So you can see that most points, almost all of them are uh, above the main diagonal, suggesting that they did do improve uh, after surgery, which is good news, okay? Uh, but they don't reach uh, uh, our performance. So they, they, they're, you know, there's variability as you can uh, uh, judge. Oops, sorry. There's variability as you can judge, but it's uh, but they do not reach uh, 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 adult performance, normal, uh, typical adult performance. Uh, so uh, they're just to make the point clear, visual their visual acuity improved, but it is still much poorer than uh, controls at which the uh, contrast sensitivity uh, reaches. The cutoff frequency would be at the order of you know, between 20 and 30 cycles per degree. So they still have a blurry image when uh, uh, seeing uh, visual scenes. Okay, so the first thing to uh, uh, assess is going back to the uh, a proposal that I've made about this. Uh, I, I'm not the one who invented this, of course, of division of uh, vision to low level, intermediate level and high level vision. We studied intermediate level vision and asked, okay, how well are these uh, uh, patients able to use various cues to uh, extract uh, uh, information? And specifically, we used, remember, we're testing kids between, I don't know, uh, seven or year, eight years old till maybe 18. And so we need to uh, keep it simple, uh, especially also that we will not be lost in translation. So we're using simple tasks, such as an odd man out task. So in this case, for instance, they see on the screen uh, different ellipses, one of them different in color, and they have to touch the one which is different in color. And you show them a few examples and they learn from examples. It's very simple for them. And you can do this with color or size, or shape, occlusion, shading, or 3D structure. So we see we're moving from, and, and also subjective contours. So we're moving from simple low level cues to mid level cues. And of course, to put the, the them for a fair comparison with controls, we blur the images shown to controls so that the uh, blur, image blur that they experience is not the reason why they do poorly compared to comp controls. And when we did the, okay, so here's a movie just to give you some idea of what it looks like. Okay, so they touch the screen. Uh, so you have no trouble with color. Here's an example of a nine, nine-year-old. You know, when they, he's looking at shade from shading, serious trouble here. And similar for other cues, uh, I, I, for the sake of time, I'll run it and he, I'll go here fast. And just to make the point that initially, at least, they have no trouble with low level cues. But if you look at mid level cues, that they have to find the uh, odd man out based on shading or 3D contours, these uh, cubes here or uh, the subjective contours or occlusion, they're much worse than uh, controls, as I said, after the blur, after imposing the blur on controls to put them on equal ground. So they're initially impaired uh, uh, in vision functions requiring simple inference functions. Hey, Udi, but, can I ask a question? Absolutely, sure. Did you ask them if they even understand what is presented? I mean, you show some texture of uh, uh, several items, but I wonder if they, for example, the shape from shading for uh, to us, it looks like it's clear that some of them are, you know, uh, bumping outwards and some of them are going mm -hmm. inward, but maybe they don't even understand that or the 3D, you know, they just... Uh, so, so the, uh, good, good point, uh, Sean. The first thing we want to make sure is that they understand what the task is about. Okay, so the task is an odd man out, and it's throughout all the tests. Okay, so it's helpful to see that with color they have no problem. So understanding that you have to find the odd person is not the issue here. It's rather the the ability to tell shape from shading. Now. Again, there's some uh, details here, which I'm skipping, but, but generally you see that they're, they're initially impaired in these simple inference uh, functions. Well, interestingly, when we tested them a year or two years later, you find that they actually improve 
in the, in the, the test. So shape from shading is no longer a problem if you test them wow. later. And also uh, occlusion, this is not published yet. So, but, but that is the case now as we sort of uh, test them longitudinally with time. Interestingly enough to tell a shape from uh, the, the 3D shape uh, in these tubes, they, they, they still have a problem. So it's not that they improve in all tasks, but they seem to be improving in, in many of these tasks. And also- Udi, Udi uh, a question. Yes. Uh, this shape from shading, it's not really shape from shading. You could solve it just by looking, just by so, sort of looking at the dipole of uh, white and, and black. It's uh, Absolutely, about... Rafi. How, how right you are, Rafi. So the one thing that we found is, uh, if you look at the details of the paper, is you're right, you could do this based on, on the, these dipoles. But the question was, if you move from only five distractors or six uh, elements to 12 elements. If you do this, you, you go serially through the elements, okay? Well, you and I typically show parallel processing on these elements. So we, uh, indeed, we saw that some of the uh, patients were able to do this, but they did this in a serial fashion, okay? So they may have uh, found a way, which is always an issue. Can you find a way of sort of a, a detour to solve the problem the, without the, 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 the doing the using the strategy which we thought they were using, so we were very uh, aware of this and we took uh, care of this. And I won't get into the details, but you're absolutely right. The, the point is that with time they get better in the, these tasks. As I said, not with all tasks, not only that, but also with uh, when using sort of illusory contours. You can see here that's the data uh, which you can see. The proportion of correct answers is a function of the uh, what's called the support ratio. So when the support ratio is smaller, it's the task is more difficult than telling that this is a, sort of an odd man out, that this is a square here in the presence of, uh, of triangles. So you would agree with me that this is a bit more difficult than here. And also with control, you see some that the, the uh, responses are not quite uh, perfect as the support ratio becomes smaller. But with the patients, initially they're at the level, almost the chance level, but with time and uh, with repeated uh, testing a year or two years later, you, you can see that they also show improvement, not quite reaching the level of controls, but maybe they would reach the level of controls. So to summarize here, we find that at least some uh, inference re related to shape, which are based on spatial uh, elements, is uh, can be accomplished with uh, learning uh, through time. Although one must say that the way to check this is to show that they generalize to other uh, images. So we had hoped to do this in our next uh, trip, but we are stuck here since things are not quite uh, as good as they are here in Ethiopia nowadays. Anyway, the next move that we did is to move on to uh, temporal integration of uh, visual objects. And this is a study that has been done by uh, Tanya Olof and uh, uh, Mayan. Tanya did the most of the analysis. And the question here was to move on from mid-level vision to higher level vision, requiring integration of information. So basically one needs to, we were thinking of using a task which requires reconstructing object shape when seen through a slit. So the idea is very simple. You see an object moving through a slit and you have to say, okay, it's, this a cross or a sword. And I believe that uh, most of you uh, could tell that this was a, uh, a sword this time, not a cross or, uh, um, and you, you can of course make it more difficult reducing the slit. So the idea is that you uh, take an object which is composed of uh, these uh, ellipsoid elements. So th the idea here is that you have to, uh, uh, impose uh, temporal integration in order to uh, uh, derive what was the shape. And the way we do this is uh, by, uh, let me just uh, have the pointer, it is by uh, passing this, uh, uh, as I said, the, the cross or the upward uh, cross in either directions of motion, either up or down. And uh, you have to de decide what was uh, the, object, either what was the object uh, or what was the direction of motion. 
Okay, and for the controls, the way we do this is we blur the stimuli. This is, we do this throughout all experiments. We blur the stimuli to make sure that the controls, that the, the uh, patients don't do worse than controls simply because they have a blurry uh, vision uh, uh, due to amblyopia, which remains even after the optical correction. Okay, so, Two tasks, emotion direction uh, uh, discrimination and shape recognition done in two uh, different sessions within the same day. And here's the uh, data. So of an, an example, so what we do is we start with a large slit width so that you can see the whole image. And with uh, using a staircase, you uh, decrease the size of the slit width um, with every correct answer. And you're trying to basically using uh, to assess the threshold uh, using the last uh, reversal. So here's the data for the control in the patient. You can see that both do very well. But when you uh, look at the uh, same, uh, the data for the same uh, um, subjects, control and patient, when one had to judge which shape was this, you find that the control is doing much, much better, meaning that its threshold is much smaller in terms of the slit width that uh, it can do at 71% uh, uh, correct is only 7% of the total uh, object, while for the patient, this is 44%. Well, never mind that the actual percentages are not that interesting besides one point. And that is what we call the integration threshold. And the integration threshold is your ability to uh, uh, tell if it's an upright uh, uh, cross or uh, what I call a sword based on local features. And what would be the local feature? If you're able to see the, 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 the end of the cross and the, uh, 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 the horizontal element at the same time, you are able to tell, ah, is this a cross, as is the case here, or is this uh, the sword that I mentioned, the upright uh, cross, based on that information. Once it's smaller than that, you have no other way but to integrate the information across uh, split views in order to basically uh, achieve or, or rebuild uh, the shape in your uh, mind's eye. So uh, we have an integration zone uh, or a temporal integration uh, uh, value, which is a critical value. And we really ask our, our uh, uh, patients within or above or below this uh, uh, threshold value. And the point to uh, say is that for the direction, there are both patients and controls of the red here are the patients and the controls are in uh, white. So they're way better than the integration threshold uh, for uh, direction. So they can judge the direction of motion uh, perfectly, just as good as controls, but with a the shape, they are poor and they are near the integration threshold. So once you're below this integration threshold, they're unable to do uh, the task. This is uh, the mean performance. When you look at the individual, there's some uh, variation among them, which we'll show in a minute. But the point to uh, make is, of course, that in order to extract the shape, you first have to know the direction of motion and the speed, right? Because you have to build this sort of in a, in a puzzle-wise to, to, to move each sliver shown to its right position based on the direction of motion and the speed. Okay, so you need to uh, extract the, the, the velocity components in order to uh, use efficiently use temple integration to build the, the object. Okay, now when we look at this, we also find somewhat surprisingly, I must say, that they improve with time. Okay, so here's the, 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 uh, the data of the patients when tested uh, a year later and a few days later, and you see that with Further exposure, these, uh, the patients uh, all except one reach below their threshold is below this critical value, suggesting that they all use temple integration. Okay, so I must say that uh, I was quite surprised that they actually can learn to acquire such a sophisticated um, cognitive visual cognition routine 
But here, here we are. And the next thing we wanted to make sure is that they do this. I expected one of you to come up and say, ah, well, maybe. So this is something that Merav Achisa brought to me. Well, maybe they're using a different strategy than you um, thought about. Maybe they're comparing the, the interval until this horizontal element comes and the interval after the horizontal element and saying, okay, which one is shorter? Okay, and using these two interval measurements, they can tell if it's, a, uh, it's an upright cross or an inverted cross. And therefore, they're not actually doing an integration over time to uh, uh, discover shape. So to deal with this, we decided to use a completely yeah, I, new... Yes, Sean. Yeah, I do have a question, not the one that Mirav is brought up, but um, I, I do want to ask if you think that the, I mean, the fact that they're actually doing the motion in a typical manner, do you think it has to do with the fact that motion mechanisms are, or at least basic motion mechanisms are, um, we know that they're different uh, and maybe they have, uh, either they have caught up really fast or they were to begin with uh, not impaired despite the congenital blindness, whereas, you know, orientation yeah. and shape is something that is, uh, that's what's absolutely. Lacking. Absolutely, Sharon. I was planning to get there in oh, the end, fine. but you're absolutely, no, no, you're absolutely right. Yes, I think that one uh, must understand that for, you know, uh, first of all, motion does not depend, crucially depend on, on high spatial frequencies, okay? And as I said, yeah. even before surgery, they have very rudimentary vision, but they can, if you're using a light source and moving the light source, uh, in front of their eyes, they are able to tell you that uh, it's moving left or right. So they okay. have some rudimentary, rudimentary uh, uh, motion even before surgery. Okay. Okay. So getting Wait. okay. So get getting back into this issue of of uh, shape temple integration. Well, you want to make sure that they can generalize to uh, new uh, images. And since I'm running out of time, I'll just say that they are able to uh, generalize, although not all of them. Okay, so this is a sort of a, a complex uh, stimulus or, or results that I'm showing here, but okay. So, so these are the, the stimuli that we've used, the pair of stimuli that uh, we've used. So let's say you, uh, you see one of these objects moving through the slit and you have to decide is it uh, object one or it's uh, uh, foil, it's paired foil. And of course, as you can see, these change gradually. So uh, clearly, using sort of temporal integration helps you solve this. But again, there's this integration threshold that you may be able to tell, say if there's this mushroom by seeing the, the full object, if the slit width is bigger than the mushroom head, you're able to tell, is this one mushroom or the, the, the more, uh, the, the, the bigger mushroom that's displayed at uh, object number two. And basically, if you, without going into the full details, uh, some of the kids are able to generalize to this, although not all of them. And the reason that we think that, well, maybe for instance, they've uh, learned a specific task with a specific stimuli, but uh, also maybe this is a, just a, a, a more difficult task because of variation. You can't keep in your uh, long-term memory a specific uh, shape to which you compare, but these are novel images that you use. So I think this is a, a, a more difficult task. And this is the, re uh, the reason why not all of them are able to actually generalize to this uh, task, but, but uh, uh, quite a few of them do. And these are the ones which are, are plotted here uh, at the, uh, uh, well, let's not go get into the details. Believe me here, if you want, we'll, be, we'll discuss this uh, later because I wanna get to the final point that I wanna make. And, but, but just to summarize here, so also with shape temple integration, which is much more difficult than the mid-level vision, we find that uh, uh, these kids can recognize objects moving through uh, uh, a narrow slit using complex temporal integration uh, processes. And they are acquired late despite the early uh, deprivation. And the last, uh, uh, function that I uh, wanted to, uh, to share with you and to uh, uh, hear what you think about is understanding gaze and shared attention. 
And the reason we chose this is, okay, this task is interesting, both from a computational and from a co cognitive point of view. So I'll start with a cognitive point of view, as uh, most of you probably know, once the, the claim is that gaze understanding is sort of a precursor for uh, learning to understand the intentions of others, okay? So what is gaze understanding? Gaze is the fact that, okay, the child sees the mother looking at the objects and uh, therefore uh, he understands that the mother must be looking at the objects from the eye and head position or in orientation. And uh, next, what he does is uh, also look at the uh, object of gaze of another person. Okay, and here you can see that this is, uh, it can also be seen in very, very early, already at infancy. Okay, so it's formed very early in an early childhood. And now, so as I said, so cognitively, it's, a, it's extremely, it's extremely. No, must be down, down, down. Yeah, uh, so uh, cognitively, it's extremely interesting because as I said, it's uh, thought to be a precursor of a theory of mind to interpret the intentions of others and to uh, figure out what would be their next move. So this could be exploited in social settings uh, if one thinks about this in, in the negative way or that it's sort of the evolutionary way, but also it could be also used to, to uh, uh, tell if there's a predator coming, for instance, and so on and so forth. So it's clearly uh, behaviorally a very uh, important trait for social understanding uh, as well as for other uh, means. And, but computationally, it's not trivial, okay? It's not trivial because you need to recover the direction of gaze from the person's head and eye orientations. You may see my eyes and I sh shifted to the right and uh, downwards. But what is the vector? Where am I looking at at the world? It's not a trivial uh, task at all. And uh, I think uh, Shimon Ullman and his colleagues, Dani Arari was one of them, uh, had a great idea, I think, uh, regarding this. And uh, because the question is, how can this, developed in an unsupervised manner. So remember, uh, as I said, vision develops in infants, unlike in uh, Amnon Shashua's uh, uh, car, autonomous car, in an unsupervised uh, manner. So how can you pick up, uh, where am I looking? Where is it in space that I'm looking to? So the, the, the first thing to realize is that you can make use of videos and use the hand as an object mover. What do I mean by this? Objects are usually static. They don't move in the world. Unless, uh, and unless some, someone moves them, they stay in the same position. So all you need is, first of all, is a rudimentary motion detector relating to what you mentioned before, Sharon, uh, which you use to uh, basically capture movement on a, an, of an object which was previously uh, uh, static, okay? And by Having this, and what could generate this to an infant who sees within, you know, a meter or very just at very cl uh, close range? Well, the hand of the mother or the father or the brother or sister, or, uh, you know, the human hand is what would generate the uh, movement in st otherwise static objects. And this is a video of, uh, showing this. Uh, so why isn't the video working? Uh, 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 uh. Not sure here. Anyway, never mind. Probably doesn't uh, work with a laser pointer. You need to switch to a regular pointer. Okay, so the laser pointer. Yeah, yeah, figured. So yeah, you're right. The point once the pointer options is laser. So we need this to be pen, I guess, right? Oh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyone has any ideas? Never mind. Oh, never mind. It's not that important. What you see there, I'll just uh, demonstrate this, is a hand moving, grabbing objects, 
And when the, uh, once the hand makes uh, contact with the object, you have to capture that image. And by this, you're able, first of all, to know what a hand is. A hand is something that moves uh, an object, otherwise static object, okay? And, uh, but motion of the object alone is insufficient. So you need to basically uh, capture the hand, uh, making uh, an otherwise static object moving, okay? And now once you have this, of course, when you grab something, typically uh, you first fixate the object before you grab it, okay? So you uh, have uh, the uh, person looking, towards the object, then the hand makes contact with the object, okay? So the hand now can serve as a pointer to where the, the uh, patient or the uh, person is looking at, okay? So you can use this mover event. The mover event is the, this hand moving as an otherwise static object as a teaching signal to decipher where is the person looking at, okay? And by using this, one can now uh, generate uh, uh, basically a, a mapping of eye positions to where is this uh, vector in uh, space? Where is the person looking at? And now, so I think uh, Danny and Shimon have clearly shown that uh, using this uh, with a you know, simple network, using this, uh, this uh, mover event uh, criteria, these networks can learn in an unsupervised way to uh, extract uh, the direction of gaze of others. And the question is, okay, can actually these kids use this? Okay, so can the cataract-treated population utilize these mover event cues to learn head or eye gaze direction given their poor visual acuity? Okay, so let's think about what, what, what does the model uh, require? Well, there's a few requirements by the model. Okay, so what you need, now I need the laser again. Blah, 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 blah. Oops. So what you need is first of all, to, to perceive the head orientation. Okay, then now I'm talking about requirement to uh, understand gaze based on head, head information. So you need to perceive the head orientation. You need to attend to the uh, actor's face in order to perceive this, okay? Because if you don't attend to it, you will never know uh, what is the direction, the heading of the head or the head orientation. And of course, you need to detect the mover event. So here's a hand uh, now grasping the, the cup. You want to capture uh, the hand grasping the cup. And at the same time, pay attention to where was the head pointing to, okay? And using this, these the three elements, you can extract head gaze direction in space and have head gaze following, follow the gaze of others using this information. Now, what if you have a blurry vision as these kids experience prior and after uh, surgery? Well, prior to surgery, their cutoff frequency would be of the order of one cycle per degree or something of that order. Uh, after that, they have a, a better uh, 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 spatial vision, but as I said, it's not uh, perfect. But we'll, what we could see is that even if you're using very, very blurry images up to less than a, ha a half a cycle per degree in the image, the, uh, the model could extract the vector as in this case, usually probably using probably the head orientation rather than the eyes. The eyes are, are you cannot tell where the eyes are in the orbit, in their orbit, but you can tell the head orientation. This is sufficient for you to extract uh, the gaze direction. And it doesn't uh, to change much as you blur, further blur the image, okay? So your mover detection precision is not perfect. It's not at hundred percent, but it may be 60%, but it's good enough for you to be able to uh, uh, tell the, direction of gaze quite uh, accurately. Okay, so uh, one is able to uh, uh, extract gaze direction based on head information, even in severe black conditions, which are existent even prior to surgery. 
Okay, so regarding the model, okay, head orientation can be, uh, uh, head orientation following can be uh, learned prior to surgery, at least from the, the, the model, uh, based on the information available uh, to these uh, uh, patients prior to surgery. I said they have severe blare, but even under severe blare, you can uh, detect these mover events. Okay, so this is available uh, prior to surgery. However, eye gaze following, okay, so telling where am I looking to based on my eye direction or taking into account the eye's direction is not available prior to surgery due to their uh, uh, blur conditions. And the next thing we ask is there's sufficient uh, visual acuity for surgery to tell the eye's position in their orbit Okay, after surgery. So before the surgery, their, their visual precision is too poor for telling the eyes, but we checked behaviorally and they are able to tell if the eyes are left or right of center. Okay, so tell the eye position in their orbit uh, after surgery. To remind you, this is a, a, a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition uh, to tell uh, gaze direction. If you can't tell the eye position, of course you cannot tell gaze direction, but to tell gaze direction, you have to convert this eye position into a position in space out, the, out there in the world using this vector that we mentioned before. So the next thing we wanted to check was whether computationally you can actually tell the eye's position in their orbit uh, given the amount of blur that uh, you experience after surgery. So this is what Danny did basically. Uh, if I'm running out of time, maybe I'll uh, cut here some of the details, but just to tell you is that we used, uh, uh, Danny used a network, ResNet50, which is based, it, it, it's a network to identify faces. And now uh, he was uh, testing how well can this network train to identify faces actually use information from the intermediate levels, not from the output, but from the intermediate levels output to detect or to tell the head uh, uh, orientation, is, uh, sorry, the eye orientation, is it left or right? And uh, just to make the point, this is unsupervised learning, okay? You don't actually train the, the network to uh, tell the eye uh, position or, Rather, you train it to identify faces. And the short uh, story of it is that prior to surgery, if you take this network and you apply this, the blur that these kids experience prior to surgery, they cannot tell eye position. They can tell head orientation, but they cannot tell uh, eye position. If you do this sort of uh, uh, replicating the conditions after surgery. So remember after surgery, they experience much less blur than, than prior to surgery, but it's still a blurry image that they uh, perceive compared to us, okay? And if you do this, uh, if you basically replicate the regime after surgery, you get, uh, this is the second regime we use, and the third regime was just the control, okay? Without any blur whatsoever. And basically, to cut the story short, we, uh, showed that uh, prior to surgery, there's enough information to tell head orientation by this network, okay? But there's not enough information to tell the eye, uh, the eye condition, okay? And uh, the, uh, so, uh, as I said, computational discrimination between the faces looking left and right after surgery, uh, sorry, I, uh, I made a mistake. There's not enough information to tell a head, uh, to tell eye position, the eye position before surgery, but after surgery, when their blur is at the, the, the cutoff frequencies at around three or four cycles per degree, they can tell uh, the eye position, not perfectly, but quite well. As you can see, the model is not doing perfectly, even without any blur. And with uh, the blur, that is uh, similar to after surgery, performance is quite the same, okay? So it's uh, around 75% uh, decoding, it's not 100%, but it's quite well to tell the eye position. So to summarize, there is sufficient information 
to tell I position in the orbit, both when tested behaviorally in these patients, and also when we uh, did the simulation using the computational model, which uh, Danny did. Okay, so there's enough information post-surgery to tell the I position the orbit. Okay, so if you uh, think about the model that we disc uh, discussed, you do detect the mover event, you can detect the eye position in the orbit. And so if you attend to the actor's eyes, you expect that with all this information, the kids, the patients after surgery will be able to extract eye gaze direction in space. So is eye gaze position automatically associated with the target in space? So the way we did this, we used a queuing paradigm to study the effects of gaze. And we did this, remember you have to keep it very simple. And uh, so the way we did this is to have uh, basically the subject see a face first looking at you, then moving his gaze either to the right or to the left, okay? And then a target would show up, which was the balloon in this case. And the uh, uh, kid's uh, task was to touch the balloon as fast as possible. Of course, if the gaze, ser the gaze serves as a cue, just like the Posner task. And if you detect the gaze and you decipher what the gaze is, you touch the object when it appears in the direction of the, the, uh, the observed gaze faster than if it's incompatible with the previously previous cue about the observed gaze. And you could do this with eye gaze direction, and you can do this also with head direction cue. So here, what you change is the head direction without being able to see the eyes. And in this case, the uh, head is direction is compatible with the balloon in the right and incompatible if the balloon is in the left. So hopefully this is clear to everyone. The sort of basic uh, pose the cue, cueing, in this case, using gaze direction, either eye or head gaze to uh, look at this. And this is, I'll skip this. We, we did this with the patients. This is just a movie to uh, demonstrate this. Just to make the point, we did this both with uh, early treated and late treated the uh, uh, population. So this is a plot showing the late treated versus the early treated. But the early treated are the ones which are treated within, as I said, six months. And uh, they are at different ages. So the, the, we, we test them uh, from age you know, five to 14. So they, be, they had their uh, surgery at six months or three months of age, but we test them much later. And the uh, late treated are the kids in Ethiopia, which uh, have been, uh, had a visual deprivation lasting for years, okay? And the, their visual experience after surgery is uh, may change from, you know, a few weeks to uh, a few years after uh, surgery. So this is, and when we look at their uh, cutoff frequency, that is their spatial vision, you see that, okay, the early treated typically have a very high uh, acuity, not quite as good as uh, uh, normal, normal sighted uh, kids, but uh, above uh, 13 cycles per degree. And the late treated typically after surgery improve considerably, but their uh, 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 cutoff frequency would be of the order of two to uh, five cycles per degree. Okay, so now we look at the data from the, the, resu the results of the queuing paradigm that I mentioned. So if you look at the gaze compatibility effect, that is the effect uh, of the queue supplied by the head orientation, then you find that the light treated and the controls and the early treated all have an effect. So it's significantly uh, greater than zero. And if anything, the late treated, there's quite a variability among the late treated, but it's as big or even bigger than in controls on the early treated. But if you look at the IQ, you find that there's no effect whatsoever in the late treated, while the early treated, which were treated in Israel, have a, a similar effect than uh, as uh, controls. Again, after blurring, remember that this is blurred for controls. So what is the, the take home message here? is that with the early treated, they can use head gaze as well as eye gaze information, okay? But the late treated can only use the head gaze information. They cannot use the high gaze, in, the eye gaze information in order to automatically shift their attention towards 
the uh, gazed upon direction. Okay, so what what are the uh, what, what's the story here? The story here is the automatic gaze shift is intact for stimuli that were perceived in early infancy, that is head gaze, but not for ones that became visible later in life, such as eye direction following late surgery. Okay, so. Although, as we showed from the computational study, the, may, the, 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 the ingredients for detecting and, and following the gaze direction based on, on the eyes are there, the, the kids do not follow the eye gaze direction. So there may be a critical period for the formation of, of gaze understanding. And this is probably, the critical age is probably larger than one year because the early treated are treated by one year of age and uh, younger than 12 years because they are typically uh, uh, test or, or uh, surgically, uh, the surgery is, uh, is being done by 12 years of age. So point to make here is that there's no eye gaze following in the late treated although the components are available after surgery, okay? So one cannot deduce eye gaze direction, although one can tell the eyes in their orbit, one can detect uh, a mover event, at least from the modeling study. So the connection is not made, although the uh, components are, uh, can be uh, uh, available. And I'll skip this. We also tested eye movements. I'll refer to this if one, someone wants to ask. I really realize that we are sort of, I'm going over time. So I'll try to summarize here and say, why do we think that there is a critical period for gaze understanding? So that's one thing that we found, you know, which uh, these kids cannot recover with time. Okay, and not for other traits. So I would say that using mover events for hand and gaze identification is not optimal. It's a noisy signal. So there's better signals that you can use once you understand what a hand is, using a mover event to detect the hand is probably the not, not the best way to uh, handle this. You can actually recognize the hand itself rather than using the moving event. And with development of vision, other cues may be more effective. You wanna be able to tell heading the uh, gaze direction, not only of objects which are near you, but objects which are further in space so there may be other cues that you can make use of. And finally, uh, we must be careful here, eye gaze understanding may still develop very slowly. So typically in infants, it develops within a year from birth, year to two years from birth. It may take longer for these uh, patients. Maybe it may take years. And if you test, we test them after five years or so, it may still, we may find this. So it may still develop very slowly. And we cannot be completely sure that there's a critical uh, uh, period for gaze understanding based on eye position. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You get the point. So generally what you can see is that she has very good visual motor uh, capabilities. She can move around in space. She could do none of this before surgery. And this is six months after surgery. So they have a, and this, and she was one of the worst cases prior to surgery. So the recovery is, is, Remarkable, I think. Whether they have some uh, deficiencies, yes, I think they uh, probably will have some deficiencies. And what may be the main bottleneck for uh, development of functional visual cognition? Well, one has to remember, they still have poor visual acuity, limiting the ability to establish templates, okay? So, you know, as an example, why may not uh, recognize a blurred face if you were not exposed to the intact version? So. It's interesting that, okay, you can, uh, even if you impose very strict blur on images, you can still extract the information because you had a history, a lifetime history of uh, seeing the same images or the same image categories without any blur, okay, at, at, at fine resolution. So once you have a, uh, basically established templates of objects and uh, of various objects and categories using fine uh, spatial information, you can you you are not hampered when it's uh, blurred to a great degree. But if you've never been exposed to this, maybe this is a, is a major limitation. And of course, another is that there could be a critical 
period for learning for some uh, uh, elements, such as the, you know, the automatic action that I mentioned, gaze understanding, and also we have this for automatic imitation, which I did not get into it. So, and, and finally, the effect of limited acuity and developmental sensitive peri periods are likely to show a strong interaction effect, okay? So it could be that, okay, if you uh, did, had very poor acuity, plus you've learned late, you've been exposed to uh, the uh, object categories or the scene late, you do not make sense of it. But as I said, these uh, patients are remarkable in what they are able to attain, okay? So let me thank you here. I took a little more of your time and I have some examples that I uh, skipped. But I want to thank also the people who are uh, involved in this. And so the first person to thank is uh, Tanya Olov, and uh, who did a lot of the studies that I did, described. And also Itai Benzion, who was a surgeon, who was uh, in charge of the clinical elements. He was the one actually who went to Ethiopia uh, five years before I ever got there and started this, you know, from as a medical voluntary uh, 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 expedition. Ayelet Mekaiton did uh, the work on uh, the patients regarding uh, the utilization of gaze information. And uh, Dani Arari did the, the modeling, which I showed you some. And uh, Shimon Ulman and Uri Polat are my Israeli uh, uh, colleagues in this uh, uh, major research uh, in Ethiopia, and of course the students, many of the students mentioned here, and our patients, both in Israel and in uh, uh, Ethiopia, and finally the funding agency, the ISF and uh, the DIP program. Thank you very much. So sorry for taking a bit of, uh, over time, but if we have some questions, that's probably the time for this. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Udi. And I want to invite everybody to uh, unmute yourself and uh, give uh, Udi a, a big uh, applaud for a very insightful and uh, vision for society. Uh, yeah, very, very nice results. Interesting. And I'm opening the stage for questions if anybody uh, wants to ask, of course. Um, hey, I, I, I have a question. About this very interesting uh, automatic gaze experiment, did you try to train them in other words to carefully reward them when they do correctly and so forth and see if they can improve? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. So I mentioned Uri, okay, that the first thing that we have in this, uh, or not the first thing, but one major component of this uh, research project is to try to design some ways to train these uh, kids using sort of perceptual learning uh, tasks in order to improve them, uh, their, their capabilities. So Rafi, yes, we tried something. It's rather rudimentary. Basically, we, the idea was to sort of uh, give some reward to uh, detection of these uh, mover events and to try to, I won't get into the details, but we tried this not enough. And, and so it may be, as I said, it may be that with uh, further time or exposure, they actually are able to, uh, to, to extract gaze direction, eye gaze direction. However, they do not acquire this spontaneously, unlike infants, okay? So infants, you don't need to train the infants, they acquire this spontaneously within, as I said, a year to two years from birth. So that, they're different in that. Whether this is something that you can, see in, in 10 years is, is something I, I, I'm not sure. And training may help. It didn't help when we tried this, but we didn't do this uh, in, a, in a rigorous way, simply because we're not there. It's hard to, and, and the question is, what should you train them on, okay? I would say that the first thing to train them would be to, uh, to, to read the alphabet, okay? Because they're in blind schools. You know, it, it, it's ridiculous. These kids can, are operated and since they're in, you know, the best education they can get are in blind school. So now moving them to a normal school is a major issue. The families don't want that, okay? So they're, they're stuck in blind schools and there may be 3% of the kids there. So they all learn Braille, okay? So just to, we're trying to introduce a low vision class 
well, we'll teach them to read. I think that would, if you ask me, what would be the first priority that I think it's actually to, to teach them to read, okay? So, and, and this is a major thing that we are, it's difficult, especially now in conditions in Ethiopia to try to, to, to set this up. But yes, you are absolutely right that that would be very important, I think. Thank you. Uh, Udi, I, I want to add a comment here that uh, we, we actually discussed uh, some ways, uh, possible ways of rehabilitation and maybe uh, specifically with these automatic uh, tasks, uh, it may be uh, interesting to uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 try uh, some uh, self rehabilitation. So if we provide them with, uh, with, uh, uh, with enough uh, um, uh, examples or maybe some kind of uh, self guidance that they can use similar to the, the computational model that we, uh, that we suggested, it may be possible that they will be able to learn it uh, on their own, uh, unlike reading, etc. cetera. So uh, we, we may have uh, some advantage here since these are automatic tasks for, for uh, normal people. Yeah, Danny, I, I, just wanna, I just wanna make the point clear that I think it's amazing what they do achieve spontaneously, okay? It, this is way beyond anything I had expected, okay? And so, of course, they, they still have a, a blurry vision, as I said, but as you saw from the, you know, just the, the, the video I showed uh, just a minute ago, they're amazing. Some of them can play uh, the, with a ball, okay? They, 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 they play in the courtyard there with, with a ball. As I said, also the, the degree of image blur that they experience is variable, as you could see. Some of them have better vision, some uh, worse. There's also some medical aspects. There could be a secondary cataract. So there's, there's the different aspects that can affect their, their uh, spatial vision. But even you know, with a rather poor vision that they have, I think that what they achieve is quite amazing, okay? And, and really, uh, offers hope uh, to where they can get, okay? Uh, clearly, these are kids. They're not, uh, you know, if you tried this in at the age of 30 or 40, I doubt that uh, you would get the similar results. But they, they are still, they're kids that uh, have been operated at the age of 8, 10, 12, even 15 years of age, okay? So they're, the, uh, you know, at, as adolescents, you know, well after... Uh, childhood and they still achieve dramatic uh, performance, I think. So much better than I'd ever expected. <laughs> Udi, Oliver Braddock here. Yes. Uh, hi. Yes. What are the ingredients in your, um, <coughs> in, in, your, in your joint attention tasks is you need an understanding of 3D space if you're really going to get those vectors from the mother's eyes to the object to the child's eyes, etc. Um, and you kind of touched on it, you didn't really mention much about space perception. I mean, it seems to me that their experience when blind will be of a very different order between immediate peripersonal space of things they can touch and Absolutely. distant objects. And I wonder what you think is going on there. Well, absolutely. Oh, nice to hear from you, first of all. So one of the first things that we've done is, is uh, test size constancy. Okay, yeah. I didn't talk about this, but we had a, uh, an experiment where we, they, they saw balls, one closer to them and one further from them, and they had to tell which one, is, which one is bigger. Okay, and I was quite amazed that they could actually decipher physical size, irrespective of its distance, quite uh, immediately after uh, surgery, within a few weeks uh, or even less than that, okay? And, uh, I found this very, very surprising. And then I thought, well, I think it relates to what you said about peripersonal space. I mean, take your th finger and move it closer and further away from you. Well, immediately you can perceive that, you know, the retinal image is changing and, and it's still your finger there. So I thought they do have some rudimentary uh, vision at very, very close uh, space, maybe within 10 to 40 centimeters away from them. So maybe seeing your hand, and seeing how it's changing is, some, is the reason why they can actually acquire this 
immediately. So I think, yes, they do have some rudimentary uh, ability to judge uh, something about uh, uh, object size even before even before uh, uh, surgery. And this is why we actually uh, could see this when we tested them. We didn't test, test them before surgery. We tested them immediately after surgery. And they're suddenly, you know, within, as I said, the days they could actually uh, perceive uh, uh, actual physical size and not just retinal size. So they had size constancy. But Does that answer? What they can make of scenes at a distance of say several meters. I mean, your last video suggests that that girl could um, perform it's a, in a spatial context of say a meter or two. I wonder if you know anything about greater distances. Okay, okay, yeah. So we are, I mean, this, uh, these, these are our next steps. I mean, so one thing we're thinking of showing the, these kids scenes, scenes, you know, natural scenes and asking them where could a, where could a, a person, be hiding in a natural scene and, and looking at their eye movements to see how well are they sort of understanding natural scenes in terms of looking at the likely places where a, a person uh, could actually be hiding, okay? And compare this with control. So we've done a little about this, you know, looking at the, their eye movements. And I think that they're, they're a bit impaired on these uh, uh, conditions. But we 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 we're still we still need some more. It's just very preliminary data. But we are thinking about these sort of, uh, sort of understanding, scene understanding, uh, at you know, at a more global uh, basis, and not just objects. Understanding what an object is, uh, but rather understanding the whole uh, scene in front of them. So Thank yes, you. exciting but, work. Um, the one thing to add to that is. Uh, normally developing babies have an attention span of around out to 50 to 100 centimeters up to about six months. These children presumably weren't able to extend that very much because their vision was so blurred. And it may be that attentional loss that's actually affecting them over distant space because you know, that's they're wonderful. probably more limited. And I wonder whether it's that rather than specifically their acuity. Wonderful, Jane. So maybe I may, uh, I may show you. I mean, I, I think you're right. And I may show you just one slide if I get there. Let's see. Backtracking. On eye movements. Okay. So I think you, you may be right. I mean, one thing that we did find is that if you look at their uh, uh, eye movement patterns, when they're seeing faces, okay, they pay less attention to the eyes, more attention to, to, to the mouth than, than, than we do. So I think that in terms of, you know, their attention control may, may be different than, than, than ours. However, when you do a, a simple sort of Posner-like task, you find that their spatial attention is fine. Okay, now the-, yeah, the, the yeah. Yeah, the screen is the screen is sixty centimeters away from them, so yes. it may be that yeah we haven't tested this. If how yeah. good is their attention to yeah. further away uh, objects? Uh, but as I, I mean, said, they can do typically developing babies don't develop that kind of distance attention till beyond about six months. But if you've been deep yeah, that to a later extent, it may be that that's what's affected. Yeah, but they're, 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 remember that they're not sort of, um, I don't think that one should compare them to uh, uh, babies who had arrested development till the age of 10 or 12 years old, oh, because no. they, 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 yeah, they, they don't have arrested development in the cognitive no, sense. No, And so no. presumably, no. So, so presumably attention can, you know, at least as I said, spatial attention, can, can be learned from other means as well. And as yes, we said, yes, I haven't shown yes. you this, but spatial attention is fine. Yes, the, I agree the, with it's you. It's fine in terms of... Uh, nice you know, talk, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Udi, I have uh, one more question about the training. I was thinking you were, were talking about training with the hand, and I was thinking about the option to train them 
uh, to look at other people moving their gaze. So um, to if they are to look at other people actually doing that motion and they have to, let's say, judge, you know, but to actually see this in motion, maybe with some specific task, um, because maybe they're yeah. not even aware of the fact that these motions are taking place. And I wonder if they can even see that with their nystagmus. Okay, so as I said, they can't tell where the eye is. Is it left or right of the center? Yeah. What they find hard is to associate this with the place in the world. So mm -hmm. absolutely, you're absolutely right. The idea is to have them see on the screen someone making an action, okay? Mm -hmm. Similar to the what you as an infant experience when the mother makes an action, you know, picking up a toy or something like that and, and, and rewarding this, okay? So, so yeah, we were thinking about seeing actions done by others, of course. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely a, a necessary condition here. Udi, in a, in a different domain, do, are they capable of recognizing fa familiar faces if you give them from far away? I mean... Okay, so I haven't gotten there, but we did some, some uh, further studies about uh, uh, face perception, not in the sense of telling an identity of a specific face. That has been covered by uh, Daphna Maurer and others that even early treated uh, kids, the kids that are treated within six months from birth still have some deficiency in face recognition. It's subtle, it's not dramatic, but we tested if they are able to tell, let's say, the gender of faces, their expression, are they uh, sad or, or happy or, or their age? So other aspects of social vision rather than, than a face identity. And indeed they are impaired, but as a group, but if you look at them, they're impaired such that, uh, especially if they had very poor spatial vision, okay? So if they had a spatial vision, even after surgery, uh, if their spatial vision is, I don't know, one or two cycles per degree, then they're very impaired. If their uh, spatial vision is of the order of five to 10 cycles per degree, they're not impaired at all, okay? And the point is, okay, that's, uh, that may sound trivial, but if you take uh, typical kids and you blur the image to a half a cycle or one cycle per degree, you still are able to tell if the, if the face you see is happy or sad, or is it young or old. So it's not, simply due to the blur, okay? It's, it's the establishing of the templates which is missing, I think, in their case. Interesting. Okay, Shalom, I think we're out of question. Yes, I think we are exactly, um, yeah. Um, so um, thank you again, Udi, for a wonderful talk. And good luck. Uh, we'll be happy to hear again uh, next year or so <laughs> about additional advances in the project. Uh, next week, we will have with us uh, Oliver Gouraud. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. He will talk about retinal organoids from um, pluripotent stem cells from development to disease. Um, and um, so uh, for the people in Israel, have a happy um, Independence Day. And for across the world, um, have a um, nice uh, week. And uh, see you again. Thanks, Udi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.